We feel so fortunate that the public radio, WABE 90.1 FM, has been our partner for so many years. And now, it's my greatest pleasure to welcome again our biggest fan and supporter, a wonderful radio personality and host of the popular radio show City Cafe, Mr. John Lemley. I'm, I'm so thrilled to learn that City Cafe is popular. I didn't know until now. <laughs> Over the past couple of months, uh, first in reading her book and then having the opportunity to talk uh, for about half an hour or so on the phone uh, back uh, uh, just a few days ago, I've become acquainted with tonight's speaker and her most amazing story. I don't have to tell you that Rita Cosby has been a beloved figure on TV for more than 20 years, including 10 years on Fox News, where she hosted The Big Story with Rita Cosby. She also hosted the top-rated show on MSNBC, Rita Cosby Live and Direct. Uh, where she did live remotes from around the world, including with our U.S. troops in Afghanistan, along the U.S.-Mexico border, and in New Orleans in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Rita Cosby has won three Emmys for her journalism. She's interviewed more than a dozen world leaders and four U.S. presidents. Uh, Rita has met face-to-face -face, uh, with uh, Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi, uh, Cuba's Fidel Castro, Pervez Musharraf of Pakistan, Palestinian, Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat, and David Berkowitz, uh, the serial killer known as the Son of Sam. Do you see a pattern here? She's not, <laughs> she's not someone you want to meet in a dark alley with a microphone and a camera crew with her. Rita is currently a special correspondent for the top-rated CBS syndicated TV show Inside Edition and hosts the nationally syndicated radio program The Rita Cosby Show. She's received the prestigious Ellis Island Medal of Honor, the uh, Lech Valenza Freedom Award, and was selected by Cosmo Magazine, Cosmopolitan Magazine, as a fun and fearless female. I like that designation. Of special note, October 11th, just a year ago, uh, 2010, was officially named Rita Cosby Day in the state of New York because of her, quote, extraordinary journalism and exemplary service on behalf of her community. Rita's first book, with the great title, Blind Ambition, was a New York Times bestseller, and now she has written her second book, highly acclaimed, best-selling in and of itself, Quiet Hero. However, this latest book, uh, she considers the most important story of her life, uh, even uh, given the, the number of people, uh, the figures with whom she's spoken over the past couple of decades. Um, it's a story of her life, her father's life, a fascinating, powerful read with some very deep Polish roots. It's called, again, Quiet Hero, Secrets from My Father's Past. Now, I'm going to be very honest for a moment and say that I, I can honestly tell you that wartime narratives in general have never really been my thing. They just haven't when it comes to reading. But this book has left me a changed man. I have to say. Uh, my daddy would have absolutely loved this book. He served briefly uh, in the Navy during World War II um, after lying about his age and entering a little early, like uh, some, uh, someone else's father. Uh, he trained in Norman, Oklahoma and Seattle, uh, then stationed on a naval air station in the Philippines as a chief aviation mechanics mate. And as my father wrote to his mother, my grandmother, he said, same as a sergeant in the army. And if he said it, I believe it. <laughs> Unlike, uh, as you'll hear with Rita's father, uh, my dad was always ready to talk about his war experiences and held a lifelong fascination with military history. The entire time I was reading Rita's book, I couldn't help but feel that my father's spirit was right at my elbow reading every single word. Uh, no one was more amazed than I uh, that once I began reading the book, I 
really could not put it down. As I told Rita on Wednesday during my telephone interview taping with her for City Cafe, uh, she had so pulled me into the story that I forgot that I was reading about someone else's experiences. I felt like I was there with, with her and her father. They had, these stories had become my own. With all that said, please welcome Rita Cosby. Oh, John, thank you. That was so beautiful. I was telling someone before we started, to me, I went on this great journey with my father, but when I hear how much it's touched someone else, that's been the greatest gift. Um, I got a letter from someone the other day who said they had not talked to their mother in 30 years, and as a result of the book, they're meeting for lunch. And I just got that two days ago. And when I hear stories like that, that it's caused people to reunite and to remind of this wonderful history that you share and I share in our lives, and so many people in this room, it's really a blessing. Um, before I get started, I just want to make an announcement. Um, this beautiful blonde here, make sure she does not get any Polish vodka, because uh, Kathy has been my dear friend since kindergarten. Since I was five years old and Kathy saw on Facebook that I was coming here today and was kind enough to say she happened to be in the area. She's from Florida. So I think the National Enquirer would have a field day with Kathy, all the stories that she's known since I was five years old. But I'm so thankful that Kathy and Jim are here. Uh, Haley also is my guest who's so wonderful. Um, future journalism star intern, also at CNN now. Lanny and Brenda, thank you. Lanny is a big executive here with Sharpie, and since I've been on the book tour, I think I have stock in Sharpie pens. Um, but I'm so glad that all of you could be here tonight. Um, I also want to especially say thank you to the Chopin Society of Atlanta. Uh, what a great, fantastic, organization. And at a time where so many stories that I'm doing these days are about the economy, uh, Silvio Berlusconi, by the way, just resigned a few hours ago. Um, I had dinner with him a couple months ago. Do you see a pattern? I met with the Gaddafi. No longer. Don't have dinner with me. Okay. <laughs> but it is a sign of uh, just how tough the economy is right now. And I think all over the world, and we're feeling obviously the rippling effects here in America. Certainly I know Atlanta has had a high unemployment rate, tough times. So I just want to thank all of you, first of all, for coming here tonight to support this amazing organization because it does so many great things. And keeping music alive and keeping Chopin, who is not just, I think, a music icon, you know, Poland's poet, the piano poet, he's also a representative of history. He's such a huge part in all of our histories, whether you're Polish or not. And to see these wonderful musicians here tonight who uh, after five seconds played better than I ever could play piano um, has just been so impressive. And I just, uh, you know, I'm so honored that all of you could come out in tough economic times and support this incredible organization. Uh, I have been so touched to hear about it. It started with Elizabeth. Where is Elizabeth? There she is, who I met several months ago. And when she told me about this great organization, we met in New York. And, you know, we've been running around all over the place, all over the world. In between my book tour, I'm still covering news all over the world. And when you told me about it, she just had this infectious smile and such a love of this organization. And when I heard about it, I had no idea how special it would be that we would be in this magical place here tonight. So thank you. I also want to thank Marty Merkler. Thank you so much. This is such a pleasure. You've been so sweet to have me here and help bring me here along, and Dorota especially. Uh, you are magnificent, and you love this organization, and you love history. And uh, as you heard from John, I have just gone on the most incredible journey of my life. And as you'll hear in a few minutes, Chopin has a very special place in my heart. It's not just about music. This is really about my father and about my story. So when I heard that it was a Chopin Society, I said, this is no better place. Um, also, Lawrence Ash and your wonderful wife, Kathy, thank you so much for coming here, too. Um, I told you I've had the, I haven't had the pleasure of meeting your brother, but we keep missing each other at different events. So please give him my regards, and thank you for being here. It's really lovely that you could be here. And John, thank you for the wonderful interview on WABE. That was very, very special. Um, as you guys heard, I've had 
a lot of wonderful experiences in my life. And thank you for that great introduction, John. I've met a lot of very interesting people, uh, traveled all over the world. Um, I first started my journalism career in Little Bakersfield, California. Has anyone been to Bakersfield and survived too? You have. Consul Ash, what were you doing there? Oh, fantastic. All right, touring through. I was in Bakersfield for three years. And I'll tell you first a funny story. When I first started in television, I learned a very important lesson. The microphone is always on. <laughs> I was doing a show when I first started. And I remember my co-anchor, we would tell each other sort of funny jokes in between commercial breaks. And I was on the air in Bakersfield. I think I'd only been in the business full time. This is 1989. I was two years old at the time. I wish I was. Um, but at the time, does anyone believe me? No one believes me. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I love you. Thank you. Um, but here I was in Bakersfield, California. And we go to a commercial break. And my co-anchor tells me this joke. Tells me kind of a funny joke, a little off call, a little dirty joke. Not too bad. So we go to another commercial break. It's my turn to tell him a joke. And I've always been a good jokester, as Kathy will attest. And so we go to a commercial break. I tell my joke. I tell this story. And I'm told the microphone is off. We go to a commercial. It's a car commercial. I'm laughing. Not a Sharpie commercial. And Lanny, don't worry. And so I tell the story. I come back. I finish reading the newscast. I think, OK, great. What a great day. Nobody knows. I go back to the uh, newsroom. And the phone is ringing off the hook. And it turns out, the first call, I pick it up. And I'm thinking, oh, they must have loved my show. God, what a great feedback I got. And I pick up the phone. And it turns out it's some dirty old man. And he said, I love that dirty joke you just told on the air. Are you going to be doing that every day? <laughs> and I said, oh, my goodness. I am either, I just started in, the, in television. I'm either going to get a promotion, because my boss has a good sense of humor, or I am fired. There is nowhere in between. Uh, luckily, my boss found out what happened, realized it wasn't my fault. Um, and it was a car company. And I know that because they tripled their ads. Apparently, everybody was buying cars. <laughs> so this is the one that Rita Cosby told the dirty joke over. Um, from Bakersfield, I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina. And then from Charlotte, I moved to Washington, DC. I got a call one day. And they said, we're starting this brand new network called Fox News. Would you want to come? And I thought, what a wonderful opportunity. And I was very blessed with Fox News on the way over. Uh, I was telling Joe, where is Joe, by the way? Thank you for picking me up. You're so kind. Thank you, Joe. We had such a great talk. And I, Joe was traveling, and you were telling me a lot for your work. And for my work, when I first started at Fox News, I left with a shirt on my back one day, being told I was going to be covering an overnight story. And I came back about two and a half months later, and I had been in 90 cities. Think about that, 90 cities in about 60 plus days. And at the time, I was covering President Clinton, who's a voracious campaigner, you know, he was going to four or five different cities every day. And then plus, I was covering hurricanes, I was covering, uh, at the time, also the conventions. It was a very, very busy, very, very crazy time, uh, but a wonderful time, too. And I had the pleasure of meeting a lot of interesting people going all over the world. Um, and I've been very, very blessed. I met a lot of celebrities, a lot of very interesting people. But one thing that I did not have until about two and a half years ago, and Kathy knows this from growing up, was a father. When I was young, and I remember, I was trying to think as I was going on this journey, when was my first recollection of my father being different than everybody else? He had a heavy Polish accent and was sort of the guy with the different accent in the community. But I didn't really know anything about his history. He never talked about it. And I remember when I was about eight years old, my father came back from a run. He was a marathon runner. And he came back from a jog, and he took his shirt off. And I remember I was camping with my mother in Maine at the time. And I saw all these scars all over his body, like cracks and dried mud. And I remember seeing a hole in his arm. And I remember saying to my mother, what happened to dad? Knowing that it was something different, just knowing as a child that this visually didn't look like a normal physique. And my mother said to me, and I remember it as if it was yesterday, your father went through tough times growing up. We don't talk about it. And the door was closed. And I wonder now, and I hadn't really thought about it until I was doing the story, did I become a journalist asking questions of everybody else 
because I was not able to ask questions in my home. Fast forward, it's Christmas. I'm a teenager. I'm in the bathroom at my house in Greenwich, Connecticut at the time, and I hear my parents arguing. And I heard my father say, I'm leaving. And I thought he was leaving work. It turned out he was leaving us. And as Kathy knows all too well, uh, it was extremely abrupt. My mother, my brother, and I had no idea what was going on. My father was very emotionally void. And I never understood what he went through because I didn't know what he experienced as, as a teenager. And I think the hardest thing, divorce is always obviously a very hard thing for children and for you know, spouses, but the hardest thing I think about all of this was that I didn't understand how my father was so easily able to cut off that part of his life, us, and move on. We were devastated, needless to say. You know, I thought my parents had a great marriage. My mother did too. And suddenly he was moving on and unemotional about the entire thing. And I remember thinking, what went through, what happened to this man that he was able to just do that where we were devastated? Well, my mother passed away a couple of years ago. The good news on television, we get a lot of wonderful people follow us and know us and there's so many pluses. The negative thing is when something you know terrible happens or tough, it's very public too. I took a month off from work and everybody knew my mother was dying of cancer suddenly, unfortunately. And when my mother passed away, it was really like I felt I was an orphan because my father, I had had basically almost no contact with him for decades. So when my mother passed away, my brother and I put her belongings in a storage locker. And we thought, when we're emotionally ready, we're going to go through those items and sort of nerve ourselves to go through those items. And then just about two and a half, three years ago, here I am, you know, a journalist and traveled all over the world. And yet this amazing story came right to me just about two and a half, three years ago. My brother and I went through the storage locker. And in the corner, we saw this old tan battered suitcase. And I had never seen it before. And just by looking at it, I said, what is this? You know, it was just something so unusual. And I opened it up. And inside was my father's life. Um, for those of you who have the book, you'll see on the cover there, inside were those items right there. It was this red and white, bloody, fighting Polish armband that had dirt and blood all over it. And then I found a card with code names on it. And then I found a card of an ex-POW named Richard Kozabutski. And when I saw that, I realized what my father went through. And I knew I had two choices at that point in my life. I could continue being angry at him. He left the family. I was the child. Or I could reach out to him and find out what happened. And at that point, I said to myself, whatever loss I had by not having a father present in my life, it was minor compared to what this man went through as a prisoner of war. It was minor. So I tracked down my father, who was alive and well, thank goodness. Now he's 86 and lives in Washington, DC. Um, remarried, has a new child. And I was always the youngest before that. And I reconnected with my father. And my father was so happy to hear from me. And he said, you know, I wanted to share this with you when you were a young child. You were always curious and industrious. I'm not surprised you became a journalist. Um, but I felt it was too painful to share with the child. And now I'm 86 years old, and I'm ready to share this for history, if you make this a tribute to my comrades. And when you hear the story of what my father went through, and some of your relatives that I was talking to you about earlier, it's incredible. And I want to just share with you a little bit about what the Warsaw Uprisers went through. And it's no wonder that my father did not share this story for 65 years. Think about it. You know, you're talking about your dad, John, and how some of them would tell bits and pieces and stories. And my dad, I think it was so psychologically traumatic that he literally closed himself off. He left Richard Kozabutsky behind, came to America, became Richard Cosby, American citizen, American father, and shut it all off because it was so painful. Almost put a sort of in a lock and key and closed the door. What's amazing, my father was 13 
And as many of you know who are Polish, Poland was the Paris of the North. It was this beautiful, beautiful city, hearing music like Chopin's music and other music. And it was this amazing city. And my father was outside when he was 13 years old and saw the planes hovering above. And his father said, oh, isn't it great that there's an Air Force show today, that this is an air show? You know, they thought it was like a military show. It's September 1st, 1939. And my father said, I don't think that that's an air show. Those planes are coming from the west. The air base is to the east, the other direction. And the next thing they know, they see the bombs dropping on Poland just outside of Warsaw. And what's amazing is my father and his father decided to flee. They started heading towards Romania. Then it was the Romanian border. And my father's father was going to be part of this new government, this new Polish backup government, should this ever happen. So they head to the, I always think of this day, they head towards the Romanian border. They go into a store and they hear on the radio, can you imagine this choice? It's in September. By this point, it's mid-September. They go in and they hear on the radio, as they're fleeing the Nazis, that the Russians are coming from the other direction. The Soviets are coming from the other direction. And of course, if you know the history, the Soviets were the arch enemies of the Poles. So which enemy do I go towards? Do I go towards this enemy who has you know, oppressed us for so many years and my father's father lived in a Poland that was oppressed by Russia? Or do we head back to this new enemy called the Nazis? And my father's father said, oh, they can't be that bad. Let's go back to the Nazis. Can you imagine what a bad day that must have been to have the Nazis look like the best choice? So they head back towards Warsaw. And my father joined the resistance. My father was part of this group called the Eaglets. And it's an amazing story. It's sort of, they were sort of a souped up version of the Boy Scouts, sort of like a guardian, souped up guardian angels. They would learn to swim at night. They were shooting, all of this as teenagers, in case Poland was thrust into war again, not expecting it would be. And so suddenly my father decided to join the resistance. And what I think is so incredible about my father, my father's Polish Catholic, like many of you in the room. And yet my father at the age of 13 and 14 was writing anti-Nazi symbols on the ghetto wall. Think about that, that was a death sentence. People don't realize that even if you weren't Jewish, it was a death sentence if the Nazis caught you defying them. And then they would come over and spray paint on top, and then he'd go back the next day and put another, like a Hitler, Hitler with a gallows. And that was a death sentence if they caught you. But my father was so deplored by what he was seeing in this country, and this country that he loved so much. And then he was doing anti-Nazi propaganda. He was distributing it off trolleys. And then he grew up to be a sophisticated fighter. And what I think is so amazing about the Polish spirit that at the age of 15, my father could have left because he's not Jewish. His mother came to him and said, we had some stuff, we have some money in the black market, we can probably sneak you out, we can get you to Switzerland, a neutral country. And I love this line, this is one of my favorite lines that my father said to me. My father said, he told his mother, I will stay and fight. I would rather die with friends than live with strangers. What a great line. And here he is only 15 years old. I mean, you think about 15 year olds now, they're playing Nintendo, they're doing whatever. And my father was willing to die for Poland because he loved his country so much. He talks about one night when they were surrounded by tracer fire. It's in the middle of the uprising now. Now he's you know, into later years. Uh, still a teenager though at this point. And they decide to fight. 40,000 men and women, women played a big role too in the uprising, and they decided to fight back with everything they had, whatever was left of them, in the uprising against the Nazis. This is August 1944. So my father talks about how they're surrounded one night by tracer fire. There was so much tracer fire that he said it looked like daytime, even though it was the dead of night. And he said the Nazis were just firing all around them. And I think about the guts of the Polish people, many of our relatives in this room, they had Molotov cocktails and sticks. And in my father's unit, they had 150 guys. Two of them had guns. Think about it. And you're fighting against the Nazi war machine with everything, you know, artillery, aircraft, gun. I mean, just think about the sophisticated weaponry. And my father and his guys are still charging. I mean, I think about what guts that must have been for anybody in the uprising to do that. And my father said this one night there was so much tracer fire and his commander said, keep firing, keep firing, keep firing. People are escaping. And my dad's thinking, no one's escaping. This is it. We're dying tonight. This is it. And so my father said, 
you know, I guess, you know, I'm dying for my country tonight. And his commander said, no, 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 there are people escaping. Keep going. And they're surrounded. And my father was losing men left and right. He lost about 80% of his men that night. Think about what he must have seen. And so my father was just fighting for everything he had, thought this is it. And finally, his commander said, OK, it's your turn to escape. And my dad said, where are we going? We're surrounded by air. We're bombarded. We're totally cornered on the, you know, above ground. And his commander said, that's right. There's one place to escape. It's below ground. And so my father escaped through the sewers of Warsaw. Think about how scary that must have been, how traumatic that must have been. And the guy in front of my father had a machine gun. And the cone of the machine gun, my father had one of the guns. His guy, his buddy had the other one. That was it. And the machine gun, the cone of the machine gun, even though I think he had like 10 bullets. I'm sure if some of you have fired a machine gun, that goes in, what, about half a second. But they had to try to fire it like a rifle because bullets were so scarce. So the cone of the machine gun was hitting up against my dad's head because the guy was carrying his machine gun in the sewer. My dad was right behind him. And my dad was one of the last men out. And so he's holding onto the guy in front of him for dear life, even though that cone of the machine gun kept banging up against his head. And to this day, my dad has a scar on his forehead from that machine gun that was banging up against his head. But my dad didn't care. At that point, it was march or die. And the Nazis were throwing down you know, hand grenades, trying to flood them out, do whatever they could when they were underground in the sewers. They found out that some of them were escaping. They didn't know what parts. And the fact that they got out alive is absolutely incredible. Soon after that, my father was taken captive. My father was seriously injured by a mortar shell that came down. He was taken captive. And then he was taken to a POW camp. The last time my father saw Poland, it was October 1944. He was almost dead. He was held at gunpoint by the Nazis, and they shoved him on a rail car. His city was in total flames. 87%, by most estimates, 87, 85% of Poland was leveled. And in the part where my father fought in Old Town, which I know some of the rel your relatives were in too, it was leveled because Hitler was so angry at these very feisty spirited uprisers, particularly in Old Town. And when he found out that for the first day or two of the uprising, they had the upper hand because they had the element of surprise, even though it was a David and Goliath fight, Hitler said, level Poland, level Warsaw, and start with Old Town. So you can imagine what my father saw. So my father was taken to a camp, Stalag 4B. First to a camp called Zeithain, then transferred to Stalag 4B. In Stalag 4B, my father was starving, literally starving. He sold the suit on his back. It was a blue suit that he had for a loaf of bread and shared it with his comrades so they would have enough energy to escape. One night, the lights went out in the camp, and they decided they had to make a break for it. One of the guys cut the wires. My father and his other guys played a big role in the escape. Many men escaped. Many were recaptured and killed. My father made it out alive. Think about, first of all, it's scary in the camp, but then you're outside. You're in Germany. You know, it's still wartime. That's scary as heck. Where do you go? But they knew from a guy who smuggled a radio in the camp in the Dutch barracks, which was next to the Polish barracks, they smuggled in a radio. And they were hearing that the American troops were heading in, were in the west the west of the camp, the east were the Russians, so they weren't going to go that way. So they said, OK, we're going to head towards the west, towards America. Let's go west. Hopefully, we'll hit American lines. My father was in front line fighting five years, six months in a POW camp. He's 90 pounds and six feet tall at this point. Think about, and he's one of the more healthy guys. He's in the woods for two and a half days. And suddenly, a plane comes by, and they figure, OK, it's a German plane. They dove for the ditches, and it threw something out. They figured, OK, this is a grenade. This is it. There were about 60 poles at this point in this small group. They broke off in different groups after they escaped. Then the plane came by again, and they looked up, and they saw a star. And they realized that it was an American plane. And what was dropped out is the favorite part of my dad's story. I get emotional when I think about what it must have been like. It was a chocolate bar with a note wrapped around it, tied with a red ribbon. And the note said, 
Welcome. It's safe to walk now during daytime. There are no troops between you and our American lines. You have 15 miles to walk, and you're free. So at that point, my father, 90 pounds and six feet tall, ran to American lines, 15 miles, which was a drop in the bucket at that point. And he came to a riverbed and saw these young, amazing GIs on the other side of the riverbed who said, you're free, you're free. At that point, my father said, I am coming to America because what a great country to send their young men and women thousands of miles away to come free a ragtag group of Polish POWs. And he said, what a great country. Absolutely. <laughs> so my father came to America as soon as after that, you would think the last thing he did, he joined the Polish Second Corps, came to Italy, fought for a little bit, then came to London, met my mother, Danish au pair. First he fell for the cook, because remember he was starving as a POW, so anybody who could cook, he was going to date. And then he ended up going for the beautiful blonde Danish au pair, which was my mom. Um, then they came over to America together and settled here. Um, as a result of sharing this story, it's been a reunion with me and my father. My father is now my best friend. And I've also learned of the pain that people go through who fought in amazingly heroic situations. I've also learned how incredible the US military is. I've covered it, as you were talking about, John, in Afghanistan and elsewhere in the world. But to see how incredible in World War II, saving the world, literally, not just my father, but saving the world, and they do it time and time again. And I have such incredible respect for the Polish military and, of course, the US military. My father, when I gave him back those items in the suitcase that I told you about, the red and white armband and, and also the card, and also there was his POW tag, too, from Stalag 4B in there. When he saw the red and white armband, he picked it up, and it was almost like it was like a long-lost friend. He was holding on to it and just touching it because it obviously brought back so many memories. And I asked him, I said, why did you not wash it, Dad? There's blood here. There's dirt all over it. And he said, it's the blood of my comrades, and it's the dirt of Warsaw. I wanted to keep it. And then he was touching, and he said, I wonder who survived. My father was always afraid to go back to Poland, because remember, last time he was there, it was in rubble. He was held at gunpoint and shoved on a rail car. That was his last image of Poland. And so at that point, I said, Dad, we should go back. Let's go back together. So we were invited by President Kaczynski, the late President Kaczynski, and his wife, and we went back to Poland. It was my first time, and this was in November 2009, my father's first time in 65 years, almost to the day. So you can imagine, my father was so nervous, his hands were sweating. And the first night we came back, we were a guest again of the President and the First Lady, and she said, you must come with us. There's a beautiful concert. We had only been in Poland a few hours at that point. And my father literally was on the plane. He was throwing up. He was so nervous. It was like a child because not only was he seeing this country that he loved, he didn't know if Poland remembered what his comrades had done, the sacrifice of his comrades. And he was so happy to see the statues and the monuments and all the tributes. And I almost felt like I was with Elvis because everywhere I went, they're like, upriser, upriser, upriser. They heard my, that my father was in town. And it was wonderful to see how much the Polish people appreciated. And when they heard that my dad was one of the guys in the sewers, they were just, you know, they were beside themselves. They were, and my dad came to the sewer also and we looked and we came up and he said, I want to go see this place where I escaped from the sewer. And I'll tell you one of the most beautiful moments. It, the sewer now, if, I don't know how many of you have been to Warsaw, but where the big statue is, where the guys go into the sewer, the actual entrance to the sewer is maybe about 100 yards in the street, in the middle of the street. It's almost like downtown Atlanta. And there's a little gold bricks leading up to it, but you barely would see it. And cars are driving over it left and right. It's midday. And my father said, I want to go by and see it. And so I said, okay, well, let's stop traffic. We were filming it and everything. I said, let's stop traffic. So we stopped traffic in six different directions. Can you imagine midday, heavy traffic? And my father walks up. Here's this old man walking up, leaning and looking down at the sewer. And I'll tell you the most beautiful thing. Not a single car 
honked. Drivers had tears in their eyes seeing my father because they knew it was an old man going back to where he had escaped. They knew what it meant and they were just going like this and cheering. It was so beautiful. I also tracked down some people who fought with my father. And one of them was a guy named Felic. And we reunited my dad and Felic. Felic is the guy who was carrying the machine gun that was banging up against my dad's head for all those hours when he escaped. And of course, my dad, you know, being this fighter, the first thing he said, look, I still have the scar to this day, you know? And Felic and he just hugged. And you can imagine what a moment that was. These two guys who escaped in the sewers, literally inches apart, and now have become best friends and reunited, and they write each other all the time now. The most beautiful thing, we go back, as I told you, we were guests of the, first, of the president and the first lady. We go to this concert. We'd only been in Poland a few hours. We go there, and think about this now. The first person who comes out is a Russian pianist playing Chopin. <laughs> Talk about the irony for my father, you know, his mind is just blown, you know. Here is a Russian seeking applause from the Polish audience, you know. It was just such a surreal moment. And it was beautiful. And then I looked over, and I saw my father crying. And I said, well, what's, what's going on, Dad? And he said, Chopin, this reminds me of my days in Poland, what Poland was before the war. And it reminds me of what Poland is now. And I'm so glad you brought me back. So I just want to say thank you to all of you, because Poland is a very special place in my heart, but Chopin, and when I hear the music, I can only think of the tears streaming down my father's face because Poland was such a special country to my father and still is very, very much. And if you ask my dad now, 86 years old, he would say to you, fighting for Poland, fighting for freedom was the most important moment and the best moment of his life. We did this book together, as you know, proceeds from the book automatically go to troops and their families, to the US military because my father said I wanted to do something to say thank you to the greatest fighting force in the world. I hope all of you all be here tonight signing the book. Proceeds are also going to this incredible organization that is honoring the person who brings my father to tears because he remembers what a beautiful, beautiful country was and thank goodness is again. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here tonight. Thank you dearly.